you've already started the trade because you're not you're muted michael yeah okay good good that's fine um okay um good afternoon everybody or good morning or good evening to some of you i presume um, so we will have, be having a workshop on how to measure fiber direction tensile strength and the factors affecting it. Um, I see that we already have more than 70 attendees and there's still more people joining. So I think it's already nice to see that there's so many, much interest in, in this topic. Um, we are I'm co-organizing this workshop together with Michael Wisdom from the University of Bristol and Federico Perez from the University of Sudi. Um, the objectives of this workshop are threefold. So we want to raise awareness of difficulties because we see that a lot of people are still not aware of how difficult it is to test uh, fiber direction tensile strength properly. We also want to help to identify best practices in, in measuring uh, fiber direction tensile strength and hopefully also identify next steps in doing a better job at measuring this uh, tensile strength. So, we have sent out the agenda on beforehand. Um, I'm now giving a short meeting introduction and I'll pass the word on to Michael Wisdom, who will be presenting briefly the paper that we shared um, together with the invitation for this workshop. Then we will have seven five minute presentations by the panelists and then followed by a short discussion just between the panelists. Um, and then we have a 10 minute break after that, we will have an open discussion where everybody's invited to participate. I will explain in a minute exactly how we will organize that. And in the last 20 minutes, we will try to draw some conclusions, make suggestions for the next steps, and also discuss potential topics for the next workshop. Um, people who also attended the previous one will know that um, we are going to try and organize some more. This is now one that's already a little bit more specific than the first one on the de definition of strength. Um, but we also want to gauge the audience here to see um, which, which topic would be interesting for the next workshop. So in terms of the five minute presentation, um, we, have, we have these seven presenters here. I will not go through the title, uh, the, the titles here and they will introduce themselves. Um, the main thing that I want to go through now before handing off to Michael is the ground rules. So you might have noticed that we are recording this session, so we will put this uh, recording on YouTube afterwards. So it means that if you speak up, you will be recorded. This is just so that you are aware. We think this, imp this improves the, the value to the community if we can share it afterwards. We will also afterwards share the slides from all the pre presentations that you will see today. And then most importantly for the discussions um, after the break, um, you can write your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom or you can raise your hand. Um, essentially, you can do that at any time when, when other people are still speaking. And I will then, um, I'll either allow you to unmute to ask your question orally or if it's written out, then I will read it out to the, to the panelists uh, to which your question should be uh, addressed. Um, at the moment, we don't have the option for the audience, the, I mean the non-panelists, to put their camera on. Um, and also, if we, you can only unmute if we allow you to unmute. Um, that's just the settings for, for this Zoom uh, call. And there is still a general chat box as well. We advise you to use those only for general comments and for saying hi and not for, for asking questions. So, a, I hope that everything is clear. If anything is unclear, you can always ask that in, in the chat box. Um, but otherwise, I will hand off the screen uh, to Michael. OK, thank you very much. So hopefully, you can now see my screen. Yeah. And thank you to Jentl for introduction and for working with me and with Federico also on this workshop. It's an interesting experience. I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes. So the topic then is how do we measure fiber direction, tensile strength, and the factors affecting it. And I'm going to briefly present the paper that we put together and circulated in advance of this workshop, just to get people thinking about what the topic was, what the questions we were trying to address, and what the challenges are. So, the definition of strength. 
the last workshop we had back in the autumn, then we came up with this following definition that the strength of an unidirectional composite is the maximum stress the material can sustain under uniaxial loading, uniform units. So we had quite a lot of debate about this and the various different ways that you can define strength, but other approaches are more subjective. And this is why we came up with this approach here. If you have a stress strain curve, sometimes you will see damage occur on the way up. So this one here is, is actually relatively straight. But sometimes you'll see little low drops, initiation of damage, but that's very subjective. And the closer you look at the specimen, the more you may notice what's happening. But when you get to the maximum load, that is an objective matter. And therefore we felt that in terms of looking at the ultimate material performance, that's really the most, uh, most effective and most consistent way of defining it. And of course that definition can be applied to all the principal failure modes, but in this particular workshop, we're considering the fiber direction tensile strength. So measuring fiber direction tensile strength. This is probably one of the most basic properties you could wish to try to measure for a composite. And it's perhaps surprising that even such a basic measurement is really quite difficult in practice. And the problem really is because the composite is so strong and you have to introduce a lot of load and it's hard to get that load in without creating stress concentrations. So as a result of that, failure typically occurs at the grips, even if you're very careful with the tabbing and the other procedures. And this picture here shows a failure, not always quite as clean as this, but this sort of failure which occurs at the tab is very common. But even with more complex failures, where you might look at this one here and think, well, it's really failed in the gauge section, but actually if you look carefully, you can see there's broken fibers here. So probably this failure actually did initiate in the tab. So it's not so easy to avoid these failures. And particularly as the specimens get larger and you have to have a thicker and you have to introduce more load, then the problem of getting that load in becomes even more severe. And we'll see that in some of the later presentations. So what are the approaches? Well, the sort of approaches that can be used are tapered and wasted specimens. But if you do that, you need to have a very gradual transition to avoid any splitting occurring. So typically you'll need a radius of a meter or perhaps even larger in order to get sufficiently gradual transition that you don't see shear stresses rising to splitting. So we'll be seeing some of that from, from Lars's work uh, a little bit later. I would argue that these specimens are going to be quite difficult to manufacture. They're going to be quite large, but done carefully, they can produce good results. You can also combine the thickness and width tapering, which again, we shall see a bit later. And this again helps to alleviate that stress concentration by making the transition more gradual. The other approach which, uh, which we've been active in the past is in chamfering the plies and some very interesting work from PhD student at Bristol, Baron Gordon, who's got this method of having a very, very nice gradual chamfering on the uncured prepreg. You can see this single ply here where uh, it goes off to more or less one fiber at the tip here, very gradual transition. And he's got a very nice machine for doing this and a very nice setup to enable this ply chamfering to take place. And that really gives a good result. So I think with careful preparation, either with this chamfering technique or other gradual transitions, you can avoid tab failures and get the gauge section failures, but you have to be very careful how you do it. And there's quite a lot of challenges in how you prepare these specimens. And we'll hear a bit more about that later. Other approaches, or well, we can use hybrid specimens, and Gergay is gonna talk about that a little bit later. Or another approach is to use flexural tests. So if you test the specimen in bending, Assuming that you get tensile failure, of course, a bending test like that, you might expect for many composites, which are supposedly have a lower compressive strength than tensile strength, you might expect to get a compressive failure in that case. But with many materials, if the specimen is quite thin, you do actually get a, a tensile failure. And this does successfully avoid the stress concentration, but it does mean you have a very low volume of material just on the surface of the specimen between the rollers, very low amount of volume material, which is subject to the maximum stress. And there's also a question about whether the fact that there's a strain gradient and you don't have a constant 
strain through the thickness, but you have a, a gradient, whether that might affect the result. So, what about the factors that affect strength? So I think the, the one that I should be talking again a little bit later about is the size effect, the fact that the volume of the specimen does affect strength, as I'll talk about later. I mentioned in the context of the bending test, what about the strain gradient? Does that have an effect? I think the jury's out on some of these things. There's also the effect of strain rate, temperature and humidity. We'll hear a little bit about that later. And what about other stress components? So all of these factors are quite difficult to investigate unless you have a really reliable test. If you've got premature failure and higher variability, that can mask some of the real effects which might be caused by these different variables. So it's really important that we have a reliable test method in order to be able to assess these different effects. So just to show some of the work on the effect of different stress components, we did some work a while ago, uh, Mesam Jalvand and Mohammed Fatui, on looking at interaction of shear and tension. And what uh, I'm showing here is some results from some hybrid specimens, which eliminate the stress concentration. We use angle plies to create a combined tension and shear. And by using thin plies, we will manage to avoid edge delamination. And when we took all these precautions, we saw that actually the, the tensile strain to failure in the fiber direction was very little affected, right up to about 2% shear strain, which is a very high value of shear strain in terms of what you might actually achieve in a laminate. There's actually very little effect of those shear strains on the tensile strain. This just illustrates the, the difficulties with testing and you do need careful tests and reliable test data of this sort is really important and is a crucial factor in validating failure criteria. So what are some of the challenges? Well, I, one of the things we want to do is to have a discussion about the different test methods. Can we reach a consensus on what are the best test methods? Then we need to apply these methods, to investigate the factors that do affect strength, and we need to do this for a range of different materials. So size, strain gradient, strain rate, temperature, moisture, other effects, how much effect do they really have when we have a good test method? How much effect do they have for a range of different materials? And then we also want to see these methods used to validate the failure criteria. There's still a huge amount of work to be done to uh, assess the many different failure criteria available. And we also want to ask the question, what further research is needed and how can we collaborate so that rather than everybody doing addressing the same things, why can't we agree what are the things that need to be done and try to address them in a systematic way? So there's a few references uh, I've put in there uh, and that's really all I wanted to cover now. So with that, I'll finish and I'll hand back to you, Yentl. Okay, thank you, Michael, for presenting the paper. Um, we will not really directly have a discussion now. We will first go through the seven uh, five-minute presentations, and I will ask all the presenters to stick to their five minutes. After five minutes, I will actually interrupt you and ask you to wrap up. Um, so I'll first give the word to Federico to kick off the five-minute presentation. Yeah, we can see your screen. A second. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My five minutes start now. <laughs> okay, so when we decided to, to do this uh, session, I exposed my opinion that we need to ask uh, people from industry about this problem to check if this was an academic problem or involved all the community. So the main word I found when I started the contact were confidentiality. So if uh, there is a problem, it's difficult to get, you know, a, a, a completely uh, image of the problem itself. So first of all, I received the idea from people that calculate, that do modeling, in the big companies that for them XT is a figure, that's all. Now, from people that uh, belong to the material uh, area 
and they receive a material mask aseptic, I found that there was problem. Fortunately, we had uh, a fantastic contact, Rocío Caña from Element Seville, that um, in fact is our spin-off company that we integrated in an international uh, company like Element. So uh, I asked, first of all, Rocío, to put in a table all the tests they have performed in a certain period of time, three years. You see here the list. And the second thing I asked her was to distinguish in between those tests with no problems itself in them, <laughs> or problem uh, tests with problem. And uh, here you have uh, uh, her answer. So in green, test with small problems, and in red, test with problem. This information uh, can be represented in a table with a regular uh, scale or a logarithmic scale. Obviously, in this workshop, we are talking about this particular problem. And they have performed more than 3,000 uh, tests in three years, so they have in mind uh, uh, the, the, the main problem you can find. And uh, obviously, I, want, I was interested in finding something connected with the idea of this uh, workshop. And uh, we found it. So the, the, what I'm going to show you in five minutes correspond to this material. Here you have the fiber, the resin, and the nominal thickness of a fly. And uh, at, at the bottom, you have the two uh, variables uh, that uh, come from the test, the XT and E, the young modulus in the direction of the fiber. With the minimum individual value expected, the minimum average value for XT, and the minimum individual and maximum individual for E, and minimum average and maximum average for E2. So the test is was carried, all the tests performed by the company were carried out for this particular company, I cannot say the name, uh, using this standard that you see here. And uh, it's a typical, uh, nothing special, it's a typical specimen following the, the indications and requirement of the standard. And this is an image of the test. So uh, here you see the result of one test at the bottom, where you see there's almost a linear evolution. And in this case, five tests were summarized and all of them, the type of failure found uh, was considered valid to be considered as a, a representative uh, value of the uh, strength and the Young modulus. The problem, well, here you have uh, uh, the, the aspect of the, of the failure that uh, Michael has already shown and correspond to a total brittle failure involving the whole uh, specimen, even the specimen under the tabs. So what is important is that uh, the results using a batch of seven specimens, you can see here on the right hand side, here you have the geometry. So you have the gauge length and the tab length. And on the right hand side, you have results corresponding to XT in red, they did not satisfy the requirements. So uh, in this case, you have three entities involved. So the manufacturer, the end user, and in the middle, the tester, so the, the laboratory that performed the test. Obviously, if the minimum is not uh, reached, typically the manufacturer say, say uh, you are not performing the test correctly. But after a period of, of, of check, mutual checking, we notice in this case that uh, the values were not achieved. And in this case, typically, the end user and the <laughs> the end user and the uh, uh, and the manufacturer must agree something. And in this case, what they agreed, okay, this is the the, the, the to show the same idea by means of a, of a graph. Uh, what they did was to modify the values of the geometry slightly. Look, they changed the gauge length from 250 to 220 and the tablet from 58 to 50. And then magically you satisfy the value. So with this small modification performed three years ago, they satisfied the value. And now they are performing the test in this way. So there is a connection, clear connection in the industry of this problem. 
So uh, to conclude, just to give some uh, reflections to motivate uh, ideas or proposals. So obviously you have reducing the gauge length, you have less probability of having surface defects. In this particular case of a brittle test, it's very important. And the second is that reducing the gauge length, you increase the number of fibers that connect one extreme of the specimen, one tap with the other. If you increase the length, probably you will have fiber that do not reach the other tap and in some way are weak in the sense we are exploring now. Sorry for the extra minute or extra two minutes. Okay, thank you, Federico. Uh, the next speaker will be Michael. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the effect of stress volume on tensile strength. I suppose this might relate to what we've just heard from Federico, although actually I think not, but perhaps we'll leave that to the discussion. Um, so I would like to suggest and show some results that stress volume is an important parameter affecting tensile strength, despite the fact that in many cases it's not taken account of. But I think the evidence is pretty strong from a whole series of tests. I'll show some of those, particularly some of ours here. So first of all, some results. These were published by Okabe and Takeda, uh, and this is on bundle tensile strength tests for a UDT800 composite. And you can see quite a large number of, of tests there, spanning a different volume, different lengths. And you can see a general trend for reducing, this is normalized to a fiber strength, normalized reduction in strength as the specimen volume increases. Show some of our data. We did some years back, we did a whole series of scale tests where we took specimens, we used chamfered plies, so we got a very gradual transition at each ply drop, and we got these specimens which were then scaled. So this is unidirectional IM78552. The smallest coupon was half a millimeter, four plies by five millimeters wide, 30 millimeters long, and then all dimensions are scaled up by two, uh, four, eight, and 16. And we see a steady reduction in the strength as we increase the volume of the specimen. And this is perhaps not surprising because the strength of carbon fiber depends on the strength of the fibers. The fibers themselves show a very wide distribution of strength. And in the composite, it's not just single fibers which matter, but it's clusters of weak fibers which occur close enough together to interact and produce a failure. So because it's defect controlled, you would expect to see this sort of effect and a whole series of tests that we and other people have done have demonstrated this. That can be plotted on a log-log plot and a straight line goes through the data, which means it conforms to a viable model. And in this case, the viable modulus was 41. Some other tests we did on a high strength carbon fiber, TC35. These were done with the hybrid test method, which Gergay will present a bit later. And again, all the dimensions were doubled for each test, the length, the thickness, and the width. And again, we see that this data falls quite well on this line here. And this time we have a viable model just a little bit lower, about 25, which uh, seems to be more typical of the higher strength versus the intermediate modulus fibers. And then finally, some other data we did a while back on unidirectional glass fiber epoxy. And what I'm showing here is some scale flexural tests. So these failed in tension. And again, all the dimensions were scaled between the different size specimens. And we also had some different length specimens, which were tapered specimens with same cross-sectional area and thickness, but different lengths. When we plot the failure strain as a function of the equivalent volume, taking account on these bending specimens, the fact that you've only got a small volume subject to the maximum strain, then you'll see that the different size flexural specimens have a similar trend and the different size tensile specimens. And also the relationship between the higher strengths you get with the flexural tests compared to the tensile tests, they all fit on this one straight line, which is consistent with a viable modulus in this case of, of 29. So to summarize then, 
have shown a number of different sets of data which show consistent trends for a reduction of strength with stress volume. The point is here that we do need a good test method to see this effect. And in particular, as I mentioned earlier, if you have thicker specimens, it's more difficult to get the load in there. So sometimes you can see trends which are actually reflecting not a size effect, but actually a difficulty in getting more load into a thicker specimen. These results were consistent with a viable modulus in the range of 25 to 41. And so I would argue that the volume is really important to be considered for accurate strength predictions. If you want a conservative allowable, you can just choose an appropriate value and everything's fine. But if you're trying to actually accurately predict the failure stress, you need to take account of this. There are still some open questions. For example, is the effect of the length and the cross-sectional area the same? I've shown plots which are related to volume, but uh, I don't think it's totally uh, satisfied whether the length and the cross-sectional area have different effects. There's also some question about whether there might be a strain gradient effect independent of a stress volume. Despite the results I showed, which seem to fit on a single viable plot, there are still questions about that. And so I think we, we need to get more data, and particularly we need to get a range of different materials to examine these more widely and to see what the effects are. So there's some references in the presentation. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you, Michael. Um, then I'll pass on the word and the screen to Dennis Giphardt. Uh, yeah, and in the meantime, there are some people that are already asking questions. Um, that's fine. Uh, we will get to them after the break and after we've also had a discussion between the panelists. We can see your scene there. You can get started. Hey, yeah. Hello from Hamburg. Um, my name is Dennis Gippard, and I'm working here uh, in the group of Professor Bodo Fiedler. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to share today uh, some of our experiences with the tensile strengths of uh, GFRP specimen, and especially here considering environmental effects and uh, to some extent also the specimen geometries. Um, yeah, first I just want to recall some uh, of the main issues um, one might have with the environmental uh, testing of UD composites. And as uh, all of you know, we have there um, a diffusion through the matrix and the interface, some swelling, weight change, which all might introduce some uh, pre-damage to um, the composites. And um, just speaking especially for GFRP, um, most uh, investigations um, state, uh, state there that um, we find a decrease, sometimes more, sometimes less, um, in UD composite strength. And um, for specimen preparation, to come back to this topic, um, there are always some additional um, difficulties or challenges. So, for example, there's always a question about um, sealing edges before aging, after aging, cutting after aging or before, um, bonding of taps. Uh, we heard of this um, before and we will hear. Um, so there are some um, extra challenges I just want to address here. And um, then there's always one thing to find that the composite UD strengths might decrease on a microscopic scale. But still today, it's um, kind of uh, difficult to um, yeah, find out which of the constituents might have what kind of influence. So we have the fiber, the matrix, the interface, and all of them might have their um, yeah, part on the, on the final um, decrease. And uh, I will just shortly show you here some data we, we measured here. This is um, one investigation where we had uh, three different UD fiber fabrics. Uh, with the same matrix resin and uh, we aged them with three different temperatures and what you see here is um, tensile strength um, related to the absorbed amount of water so the weight gain of the specimen of each single specimen and to make it short um, what we found here is that uh, you can see a drastic decrease of the strength um, with um, the highest amounts of absorbed water so and we're speaking here about more than 50 percent of the strength decrease um, but on the other side, for moderate uh, water absorption, the strength decrease is also um, more moderate. So at least we find here a two-staged um, behavior. And uh, on the right side, you can see um, the results of the specimen tested and um, what is some kind of nice in terms of having reliable results is 
that uh, we found that with um, yeah, uh, increase in weight gain and, and uh, absorption, the failure of the specimen uh, was even more localized. And it was more or less always in the free gauge section, so that the results um, became quite reliable and the um, standard deviations um, get also smaller. In the, in the microscopy pictures, you can also see um, that this might be mainly affected by the decrease in interface strength. So um, we found that this might uh, decrease strongly with water uptake. But as addressed before, we also see in the top uh, that we faced some splitting um, failure with the dry ones, and that we also had failures within the um, gripping sections there. And as you can see, um, for this investigation, we simply used a rectangular specimen without any taps, which was nice as we don't had to bond some of them after the aging process. But this might also lead to some extra problems. And um, regarding the dry ones, um, we then thought about um, how we can um, face or tackle these problems. And uh, as many others of you, we um, thought about um, using dog bone specimen. And um, yeah, after reviewing um, some literature, we found, let's say, a huge amount of recommendations what to use. Um, but some of them were not feasible as they were, for example, um, recommending oversized specimen, uh, which were much longer than the standard specimen, which were not feasible for production processes. And uh, others lead to splitting failure, as we have seen before. And uh, the, the way I just want to address here, we, we are going right now, is that we applied um, the comp dump, a continuous damage mechanics um, material model from um, NASA Langley. And um, we just used it for comparison of different um, uh, yeah, dog bone specimen geometries, where we always had kind of a rectangular middle section and then changed the radius and the uh, other parameters. Indeed, you need some material properties like um, matrix strengths, uh, transverse strengths, stiffnesses, fracture toughnesses. But as you have them for your material, um, you can quite simply compare. And this is what you see here in the middle. Um, there are just two examples for um, different geometries, one showing um, the matrix shear failure here and um, the other one showing it not at the same loading. And with this um, kind of um, improvement, we um, were going into our tensile test, I see. And uh, what you see here on the right side is the, the one uh, geometry we've chosen then uh, in comparison with the rectangular. And it was, so we were able to increase the strength by about 12.5%. And regarding the environmental effects, we just checked um, how tabbing would influence uh, the results. And as you can see here, it was not possible to increase the strength by tabbing again. So this is the both points uh, we wanted to address. And with this, um, yeah, I'm through and I'm, thank you for attending and uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, then the next presenter is Gergay Sell. Yes, hopefully you can hear hear me now and let Wait, me just hear uh, you. share the screen. Yes. And we can see your screen. Yes. And now it's uh, full screen, right? Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, yes. Um, greetings from uh, Budapest, I'm Gergely Zell and I would like to uh, introduce you the hybrid specimens for accurate determination of the tensile failure strain of UD carbon fiber reinforced composites today. Um, this work has been done uh, in Bristol uh, a few years ago and we published this paper um, in Composites Part A in 2016, which is here for your reference. You can find more details about the, the study there. Um, on this first slide, let me just uh, quickly introduce the test setup, which is a standard and uh, normal um, setup for uh, um, tensile tests. Uh, 
it's uh, important to use an external uh, extensometer for measuring the strains. Can be a clip-on, a mechanical gauge, or a um, video extensometer. But uh, there is actually nothing uh, much special in this uh, test setup. But what is more special is the specimen uh, geometry, where we have a central layer of um, carbon epoxy, which is under investigation, and it is sandwiched between glass epoxy uh, layers, which go all along the specimens. And you can uh, spot that we are not using uh, antabs in all the time. And actually we confirm that it's not necessary for uh, good results to use antabs. Um, in the paper, we have a, a study about the strains in the glass epoxy and the carbon epoxy layers in the cross section near the edge of the end tabs. So we modeled tabbed specimens, but it can be uh, uh, the edge of the grip uh, as well. And we can clearly see that there are very high strains at the, uh, in the corner at the edge of the, uh, at the end tab. Uh, but on the other hand, in the carbon epoxy layer, we have actually lower strains than the far field strain uh, of the specimen. And this is because we have uh, the stress concentration in the glass epoxy protective layer, not in the carbon epoxy layer. And this saves us from uh, premature failure near the tabs. Um, we developed some design equations for the glass epoxy layer strengths and thickness. Um, please note that we, leave to, uh, we need to leave a margin for stress concentration in the glass fiber epoxy material, uh, which is in contact with the grips or the tabs. And the most important probably is to ensure that the specimen delaminates and doesn't fragment. So the carbon epoxy layer doesn't fragment. That could compromise uh, the failure strain results of the tests. Um, uh, let me show you our initial results, which are included in the, in the paper. These are done with uh, Mitsubishi TR30 carbon fiber in epoxy matrix. And we observed uh, consistent failure strains measured with different configurations with different number of um, carbon plies in the specimens. Also uh, one specimen type without antabs. Um, it was reasonably simple to uh, determine the failure strain through these significant load drops on the stress strain graphs, which is visible in all uh, series graphs. Um, and the consistent gauge section failures, which we observed and these are actually non-tabbed specimens, which we included in the paper uh, as photographs. I need to highlight that the strength has to be calculated separately uh, from the failure strain of the carbon epoxy measured uh, independently uh, on normal specimens because we don't have a, a direct uh, way to calculate or evaluate it from the tests. Um, as Michael uh, uh, mentioned earlier, we have done some scale tests uh, where we also um, uh, confirmed that the specimen fabrication was quite simple, just stacking um, prepreg sheets together and cure them in an autoclave. Um, we didn't use antabs for these specimens and there were no problems with the slippage in the gauge uh, or in the grips. And then um, we also observed the uh, consistent gauge section failures for these specimens. And as it has been shown, we managed to uh, determine the size effect or volume effect actually uh, in the specimens without uh, the parasitic effect of stress concentrations near the grips with uh, quite uh, low scatter and a good fit on a, a straight line in the log log plot. Um, for these tests, uh, as well as for the previous ones, we used a thermal residual strain correction, uh, which I give uh, this slide only for reference for you, if you want to uh, double check later how to do it. And finally, uh, let me show you a few more results with more commercially available uh, carbon fiber types. Torres T700, T800, IM7. Um, we have the fiber, uh, uh, strain uh, in the first column. Second column is the composite uh, strain given by the manufacturer in the data sheet. Green is uh, monolithic uh, uh, carbon epoxy specimens tested by ourselves and um, the red one is the hybrid specimens 
um, also tested by ourselves. You can clearly see that the higher, highest strains are obtained with uh, the hybrid test method, that the scatters were not too high, and, um, and uh, we found this useful for uh, accurate determination. I just included the volumes for reference, and uh, to conclude, we got superior accuracy due to elimination of stress concentrations of the grips. Um, we found the specimen design and fabrication uh, simple enough, and also the evaluation was um, pretty easy. Uh, it was possible to detect the failure position on the specimens and also the failure strain on the stress strain diagrams. There are still some open questions. Uh, for example, if you can use this technique uh, for uh, specimens made uh, by other techniques, not uh, from prepregnant autoclave, and if we can find uh, suitable materials for this, but hopefully we can discuss this later on today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerke. And then we move on to the fifth presenter, which is Lars Mikkelsen. We can see a screen. Yes, and you can see it. You. you can get started. Good. Okay, so uh, I will present some uh, result from of what I call pure uh, UD composites. So, so UD, as we can imagine, so uh, so is a result from uh, protruded carbon fiber composites and prepreg carbon fiber composites. Actually, for in the wind turbine industry, now protruded, protruded uh, carbon fiber composites. UD is uh, coming in in large number, and, and there's actually a, a rather a big uh, demand for, for testing this kind of material. And in principle, it is, is a, it's a very simple uh, material with a very simple uh, microstructure. You will see uh, that uh, here I have uh, shown the, the, the fiber orientation, uh, and even though there are some marking indicating uh, some off axis, maybe up to 10 plus minus 10 degree. Then, uh, then it's actually a rather small number of fibers which have this misalignment. So, so normally we see fiber misalignment in between plus minus two degrees. So very aligned fiber, very high fiber volume fraction uh, for this kind of material. pre prep is similar. Here we also have high volume fraction. We may have that the, the ply in itself have been misoriented a little, but if you look in, inside one ply, then we get the same uh, distribution of, of uh, misalignment. So uh, <laughs> testing this, so first uh, I will look into some tests we have done for so some years ago uh, on, on pre-prick. Uh, that was actually Paul Bronstad was, was involved heavily in this and, uh, and Jakob Beck uh, and all uh, in our lab. Um, here we was testing uh, first some rectangular uh, samples. Uh, so the, the top uh, uh, test sample here, which are the ISO uh, uh, sample. This, uh, and then we have compared the results for different thickness of, of the material. So the nice thing with prepreg is that we can just, as uh, you could say, change the, the thickness. And we think that it's not really uh, influencing a lot on, on, uh, on the material properties. So we should get uh, the same behavior as long as we don't have a strong size effect of the behavior. Uh, here we can see that when we come above a certain thickness, then we have that the strength is decreasing for the rectangular sample. <clears throat> then if we instead made some butterfly with the same material, then we can see that at first we get some strength value which is a little higher. Uh, I may mention here that the, the rectangular one was made by mechanical grips while the Butterfly was made by hydraulic groups. The butterfly sample, we can see that for the thickest sample, we also get some degrees in, in, in the strengths. So, but then we could also try to make an even longer, <coughs> more narrow sample because we have a rather uniform uh, fiber architecture. So here is a eight millimeter wide sample, while it's 15 for the other two. Here we can see that, that we are getting the same strength of, of, the, of the material uh, for, for the up to the thickness uh, of 5.5 uh, millimeter, which was the thickest case we was uh, looking into. 
If you look at the failure <coughs> modes for this prefect and for the rectangular sample, that's what I show up here. Um, so it's corresponding to the red uh, point up, uh, up in the corner. So for the thin one, we have that uh, the, the, the failure was explosive. So all the material was more or less disappearing. So whether the, where the, the material is failing first, it's hard to say. It could be at the gripping, but it also could be something, something else, somewhere else. It's only the, the elastic energy which are damaging the material when it begins to fail. <clears throat> For medium thick rectangular sample, while the strengths begin to drop down, we have a failure at the grip section. And if for thick uh, samples, then we have just tearing off the, the tap material. So clearly here, we are, we are not testing the material and we get conservative values. If you get, take the thick butterfly, which was also a little lower, then we have that the material is, have this uh, splitting along the, the fiber and we had tearing off the, the, the sample. <clears throat> if you take the X butterfly, then even for the thick case, we are still getting this and I would call this uh, maybe a, a global uh, failure uh, uh, all over the, the sample. Protruder profile is what we are looking into now also. And, uh, and for that, uh, here are some, we could say, uh, measurements for that. Again, using the, the same uh, test geometry, so the rectangular, the butterfly, and the X butterfly sample. And if you just look at uh, the same uh, sample geometry as before, also with, with uh, taper tap, then we have again that from the rectangular to the butterfly, and then to the X butterfly, we get increasing uh, strings. We can see also that if, if you put continuous taps or this protective layer on, then we get even higher values, which may be related to uh, that we are removing the, the stress intensity. It could also be a hybrid effect. So that's uh, in some way up to discussion. In principle, <coughs> testing um, UD composite is in principle to test a lot of uh, fibers. So, in, so we should be able to, to come from the fiber strings to the uh, composite strings. But fiber, we know, have a high, you could say, large uh, size effect. So what links should we use? Uh, so therefore, I put some points for discussion here. I'll not uh, uh, list them here, but, but you can maybe read some of them. Uh, but, but the question is actually how to validate the quality of the test method. And do we violate the, the, the failure modes by adding uh, ductile material in the gate section as we do by put some, uh, some uh, continuous tap material on and how to come from fiber or bundle strings to material strings. In principle, we have a, a simple microstructure. We may also argue that, uh, uh, that talk about what is the size of the damage zone because that's related to what Links should be we relate uh, for regarding the, the fiber strings. Uh, and uh, how is the influence of uh, fiber undulation? We know it has a high inf uh, influence in compression and also some way in, in, in stiffness, but uh, how does it influencing the, the strings also for small values of the undulation? So thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, then I will be very strict on the timing of the next presenter because that's myself. Can somebody just confirm that you can see my screen? It's fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I want to talk about an alternative. Um, to the strategies that you've seen before, primarily the continuous steps in the butterfly design. Um, and I will be talking about arrow shaped taps or arrow shaped end taps. Um, this idea originated from Sergei Sapoznikov, uh, who developed this many decades ago, uh, but is, as far as we are aware, has never really been published. Um, and I would argue this is an easy to implement strategy and a really good one at measuring longitudinal tensile strength reliably. So we have a range of potential tap configurations. Obviously, you can tap without taps, which I would strongly advise against. You can tap, you can have the standard rectangular taps. Some people will also taper them, but 
Um, when we tried to do this, our workshop was not very satisfied because they were quite difficult to manufacture in practice. Machining composites is not a pleasant thing to do, especially not under the very sharp angles. Then you have seen the continuous tabs. Um, I think they are only really reliable for failure strain, but they're really good at failure strain, not so good for modulus and strength. And as Gerke highlights, it's also difficult for glass or more generally um, fiber reinforced composites with relatively high failure strain because you still need a protective layer that gets you to even higher strain levels. And then you have the butterfly design, which needs more material, which may not always be possible. And it's also more complex to manufacture, especially when you have the taper tabs. So what I am discussing here today is what we call arrow shape tabs. Um, and you see here that the echo shapes are actually inverted on the both sides. Um, and we did an experimental testing campaign that I, I have also shown in the previous workshop. Um, but essentially what we see here is that the continuous tabs give us the highest failure state. And I would claim that that is the most reliable result. Um, but the arrow shape tab actually gives us the same result. There is, it's slightly lower on average, but it's statistically sig not significant in the difference. Um, and all the others perform worse. And actually, in our case, the butterfly was actually even the worst, or about to say about as bad as without end taps. And the differences that we're talking here about are 15, 20% compared to the worst case scenario. Now, why do these things work, these arrow shaped taps? I think there's two main reasons. Um, one, they are better at handling the Poisson contraction. In normal taps, you would prevent them in the grips. And yet, all of a sudden, when you're outside of the grips or outside of the tap region, you allow the Poisson contraction again. And the arrow shaped taps have a more gradual transition and hence allow a more gradual buildup of the Poisson contraction. And they also um, have a more gradual transition in, in sort of the thickness. Um, they do have an abrupt change in the thickness, but it's spread over the width, and that helps to smear out stress concentration. Another advantage is that they have a uniform gauge length, which is uh, one of the drawbacks, I think, of the butterfly. In principle, there is a predetermined gauge length, but it's it's a little bit ill-defined. Um, and compared to just cutting the, the tap at an angle, we also have symmetry in this design with a nice and continuous gauge length. So we also tried to explain where this good performance came from. And we did some finite element modeling where we actually modeled the entire setup. Um, you see here the arrow shape. It's only, you only see half. So this is the tip of the arrow and then the rest is uh, modeled symmetrically. Um, and if you look at stress concentration, you see uh, stress concentration here, slight stress concentration here, and then again, a higher peak there. Um, so I'm going to analyze this along these three lines. Um, and if you plot them along the length, then you will see that you do get a significant stress concentration. In this case, about 200% here, about 160% here, and a pretty low value here in the middle. So you do have to analyze uh, different regions over the width to get a complete picture, which is different from a rectangular end tap, which would have the same stress concentration profile. Um, but then we can also compare against rectangular tap and paper taps. And what you see there is that um, our arrow shaped tap is a lot lower. Um, they are at almost 300% in some cases. But the second thing also becomes visible when you zoom in. Um, and this is a, along the worst position. So in the tip of the arrow, it's also a lot narrower. And it's, so it's a much more localized stress concentration, which is lower. And it's not only localized in the length, but it's also localized in the width. And that's why it's much less severe in terms of strength degradation. Now, there are still a few open questions here. Um, we have not really analyzed what the optimal shape and the optimal layout is, nor what the optimal position is in the grips. And we have to find an element model to optimize that or base that partly on what other people have done for more conventional tabs. Um, we also don't know yet what is the best in fatigue, um, whether the arrow shape that will lead to be, become delaminated in fatigue. That's something that we are also still thinking out experimentally. And um, finally, I just want to advertise this uh, high five sync school and conference that we are organizing in September. Hopefully, this is one of the first in person events on composites um, after, uh, after summer. 
So if you want to get more information, you can go to hi-fi.eu. And then I will stop here. I will then give the word to our last presenter, which is Yun Kwon. We see your screen. So can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to talk about how fiber bundle affect the strengths of unidirectional composite. So we have conducted a tensile testing of fiber bundle. And there are two different uh, way of, you know, conducting a fiber bundle tests. One is gonna be called the, uh, the direct grip as shown in the uh, first you know, figure in here. And <clears throat> the other one is gonna be indirect grip using some adapters shown uh, mostly cylindrical shape. So we use this uh, uh, second technique because this fiber bundle represent uh, those fiber embedded in composite. So when you conducted the uh, tensile test of this fiber bundle, uh, the typical uh, low displacement curve shown in this here, in this graph. And then if you see that there are some kind of gradual increase of the force and then constant, you know, uh, the increase of force and followed by the, the peak force and failure. And one of the major reasons for such a uh, that, you know, typical behavior is gonna be the slack in the fiber. If you look at the, you know, the, uh, the microscopic picture of the fiber and the fiber are tangled and there, there are a lot of also misalignment in the, uh, there too. So when you apply the, you know, the uh, constant displacement in, uh, incrementally, then not all the fiber are going to load, uh, you know, load it equally because some taut fiber is going to carry the load uh, compared to slack fiber. So as the slack fiber become taut, then they are going to, you know, uh, take the load. So there is kind of somehow increase of that until all the fiber carry the load. So we have a constant section. And then those uh, initially taut fiber is going to carry more load compared to the uh, slack fiber. So those fiber is going to fail and subsequently some other fiber fail and reach the peak value and then complete failure. So we use that, uh, uh, you know, the statistical slack fiber model and compare the model with the experimental data as shown in here, there uh, uh, is a very good correlation, you know, between the two uh, results. So in here, we did not assume that, you know, the each five has a different statistical strength. Instead that we have, a, you know, different uh, slack in the fiber, because if you have a weak, you know, the strength, that means that uh, we can model that as that, you know, uh, more taut in the beginning, so carry larger force, so that is going to fail earlier. And if you are going to suppress this uh, nonlinear section, so if you have a pretension uh, in the beginning, then you are going to suppress that, you know, the peak force or the or peak strength in the uh, composite significantly for there. And now if you embed this, the, you know, the fiber bundle into a composite, then the main, you know, the difference is gonna be the matrix material. Even matrix is going to have some crack, uh, you know, matrix crack uh, during the, uh, you know, the loading, but they are going to act as the load transfer mechanism so that the matrix is going to, you know, uh, distribute the load among fibers. So if you look at some kind of, you know, the defect in the, uh, the uh, fiber, so which is represented in the uh, decrease in the cross section, then without uh, this matrix, then this is gonna be stress increase with the change of that, you know, uh, in a decrease in the cross section, so-called unembedded fiber. On the other hand, if you uh, have a matrix here, then matrix is going to, uh, you know, transfer load from one fiber to the uh, neighbor uh, fiber. So that we have a reduced stress in here because of the matrix. And also, if you look at the, you know, the curve, uh, the, uh, the fiber, then without matrix, the curve fiber is not going to uh, have, a, you know, the, a load until it's become taut. But when you have a matrix, then matrix constrain the motion and also load transfer from, you know, a neighboring fiber to the curve fiber. So this, the fiber is going to also carry the, uh, the stress. So if you look at the, you know, the stress of this uh, curve uh, member, uh, as function of uh, the waveness ratio. Waveness ratio is going to be defined as the, you know, the height of this curve member divided by the base of the, uh, this curve member. So even uh, this curve member is going to carry the load, uh, even the stress is going to be smaller than, you know, the stress of the uh, straight fiber. 
So uh, this study showed that the wetting of fiber and their slack, you know, are very important. When you construct the fiber, you know, composite material, then not every single fiber in the fiber bundle may be wet because of some, you know, fiber inside the fiber bundle may be a little more difficult to be wet. So unless you control those wetting of fiber and their slack, then you are going to have more variation of unidirectional strength. So that this study showed that we have to control those parameter so that we have more uniform unidirectional strengths of composite specimen. That's it, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Um, we are quite nicely on time. So you have um, now scheduled 20 minutes for discussing first between the panelists. Um, and then after we'll have a 10 minute break and then we'll open up the floor for a wider question. There have already been um, some questions in the chat. We will get to them after the break unless they coincidentally already get addressed here. So I would ask the panelists to switch on the cameras for this part. Um, and I have several things that I could raise up for discussion, but I'll give the work to the others first. Anybody want to start the discussion? Can I ask you again for the first question? I like your arrow tabs. Uh, where do the specimens fail? <laughs> indications of um, the stress concentrations uh, matter. So in, in general, question is about the shape of the, the double arrow. Does it does it make any difference? This double arrow, the, the fact you've got a different shape at each end? So in general, my claim would always be the only way to know for sure that a specimen, a UD composite failed properly is by measuring or by knowing where it failed. And the only strategy that does that properly is the continuous tab approach. Um, the only reason why we know that it works quite well is that we get values that are essentially the same as with the continuous tab approach. But we actually, for these specimens, we don't know where they fail. But they probably don't necessarily fail in the grips, but uh, you would need a, a high-speed camera to confirm yeah. that, and we have not done that yet. That would be interesting. Thank you. Anybody else? I've yeah. got more questions, but I'm going to let it somebody else. Gerge? I, I have a quick question about uh, how do you manufacture the arrow-shaped tabs? Uh, simple, water jetting. Um, we, I, well, no, I think actually in the experiments, they were probably still made manually, but now we're doing it through water jetting, um, especially once we would op further optimize the actual shape of the arrow. Um, maybe you round off the tip or you not don't, you put it at a sharper angle, then it becomes a bit more difficult to do it with a, with a regular band saw or a circular saw. Um, but now we're already doing it with water jetting and then you have basically freedom of the exact shape if you have a model to then optimize that shape, obviously. Yes, yeah, so my second question would have been, uh, how do you set the angle? Yeah, for What's now, the... this was not optimized. We just set it to 45 as a starting point. Um, I believe that if you make it sharp, it will probably end up being better. Um, but we actually have not done that experimentally and not uh, finite element modeling wise either. But uh, that that we will do in the next few months. Yeah, that's that's my feeling. The sharper, the better. But who knows what's happening in the in the sharp corner in the middle of the concave uh, tab? If you have too much of a, of a narrowing due to the Poisson effect, so yeah, yeah, might be I think. To answer some of these questions, it would be really useful to have a high speed camera when we're doing these tests. Um, yeah, some, that, some that is something I think should be done at some point in the near future. Okay, um, my second question from Lars. Actually, I would like to raise this. You could say, what is the correct uh, strength? Uh, and, and is uh, by putting co continuous tap on, is that uh, the, the, the right way to do it? In principle, I think what we, sh we need is to to have a material which are so constant, so we can try out many different ways to, to, to test that and then see how they, they correlate. We all come with our own material and some are failing at 1% uh, strain, some are failing at 1.5% strain, we talk about carbon fiber. Uh, but but uh, what is the best uh, is that because one is better than the other. I think uh, one example is actually this produced 
uh, profiles because there's a continuous manufacturing technique. Uh, I need to have validated how constant is it, but, but I think it's a rather constant. Uh, pre prec can also be rather constant, but, but still you are producing them a number of batch and, and, and there may be different curing, uh, you could say, uh, behavior uh, for, from, from case to case. Uh, I don't know if anyone have an idea about what, what could be a good, you could say, uh, benchmark material to, to, to use in, 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 in such a study to... Um... Well, I, I think it's a bit difficult to make very general statements on that because, for example, I think the butterfly design and um, taping the thickness design, that works better if you have a high interlaminar fracture toughness. Uh, but if you then have a material that has very low interlaminar fracture toughness, set, then you're more likely to get in trouble. So I'm not sure whether we can sort of, at, for this specific example, it depends on the material already. Now, with the continuous steps, there are all different limitations. I think you could not go below 100 micron ply thickness. So you could not test individual thin plies um, because then you get hybrid effects and then you don't know really what the actual um, tensile strength is. So I think there's no one solution that fits all here. Any, any other thoughts on that? Yes. Federico? Yes, I, I invited people that I contacted to, to, to see the view of the industry to attend the meeting. And I don't know if they will be terrified by some of the results we are showing them, because the idea is that, for instance, the, the increase in the volume of the specimen represents a decrease in the properties. But the lateral box of an aircraft is 10 meter long or 15 meter long. And additionally, additionally, in most of the picture we have shown of the evolution of the property with a certain feature, let's say a certain dimension, for instance, of the specimen, we have not found a plateau value. So, in most of them, it is clear the tendency. Increase in the volume, decrease the, 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 the property. But uh, at the end, if the volume tends to infinity, the, the properties tend to zero, you know what I mean? So uh, this could be also uh, something that we can, we should reflect on this for future work. Maybe if we at least are able to say industry people, hey, at the end, at least you have this particular, let's say lower, uh, value or plateau value that you can consider as representative of the properties of the material. It I may come in there. I think that's a really interesting point you raise there. And I don't think it's really definitive what, what does, does happen. What I can say though is if you even a, a large aircraft structure, the local, it'll be the local stress state which will determine failure. So it won't be a 10 meter uh, area. It'll be a local hotspot, which may still be quite big, but so it's not quite as bad as extrapolating from very small coupons up to large ones. But I believe there is an effect and there are perhaps some arguments that say it might die out at very large sizes, might reduce, but I don't think there's enough evidence really to say that one way or another. So for the yeah. time being, we have to assume that it does continue. I remember discussing this thing with uh, somebody who was making transatlantic cables to, to take the fiber optic cables across the, the Atlantic. And they said that they had to take account of the fact that these cables were kilometers long in uh, judging the safe stress level. Yeah. So I can counter and ask you a question, Federico, because I, I'm just very curious about the results you showed. And uh, I, I just don't, don't think that the change in dimensions is enough on its own to affect it. I mean, I, although I've been arguing that volume is important, the, the changes were not very large on your specimens. So I'm wondering whether it's something to do with the, the, what happens at the end of the grips. I remember some specimens we tested a long time ago where we had the tabs protruding from the end grips and we got a very low failure because the, the tabs pulled off, I think pulled locally off the, the surface ply. And I'm just wondering whether, were, your specimen, were those specimens fully immersed in the, in the tab, in the grips? Because if, 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 the spec if the tab was too long and you can't fully immerse it underneath the tab, you might get some local tensile stresses at the end of the tab. Is that possible or not? Uh, Michael, we have missed the signal for a while, but I understand oh. you are asking me about what detail I have captured. I, I cannot give you details about this 
that was tested three years ago. But the, the, the configuration of the tap is regulated by the, by the, the standard. So I, I don't think it's protruded. It's but, but with ours, we had a 50 millimeter tab was all we can get underneath the, the grips of our test machine. So we tested one which was 58. Uh, in certain machines, you wouldn't be able to bury that completely underneath the, the grips, which might lead to some unexpected effects at the end of the tap. That's why I'm just wondering, speculating, but... Uh, yeah. Sorry, I miss your, your word some, some time, but I, I will have a look on, on it, on your idea. I perhaps first want to give the word to Jung because he has been raising his hand since the start. Yes, uh, I have one question for you first, that, that when you design those arrow tap, one is concave, you know, concave, the other one is convex. But if you use both convex or concave, then do you expect the same kind of result or any reason you use that kind of uh, two different combination? Um, yeah, the only reason is that you then have a uniform gauge length. Otherwise, you would have an inconsistent gauge length over the width. Um, and, and considering that side effects do matter, I, I think in principle, we could have the same, um, the same type of arrow on both sides because the side effects are not that big that that small difference would really make a big big difference. So it was a yeah, strategic decision, but I think we could have gone either way. Okay, and another question, of, you know, overall to everyone is that uh, when you design different kind of tap design, I mean, you know, different shape, different geometry or those kind of nature, then I guess one thing uh, we need to consider is going to be some sensitivity. In other words, in the design, if there are small, you know, variation in uh, geometry in, in the shape, then how does it affect the, you know, the, the, the test result? So if this is going to be so sensitive, then I don't think that is going to be that useful for industry people because, you know, uh, people cannot use exactly same geometry, uh, same, you know, uh, the size or those kind of, you know, specification for every single test. So uh, the tap design have to be a little bit generous to produce same result, even there are some kind of small change and variation in uh, those, you know, the, uh, the uh, configuration. Who wants to respond to that? Uh, I, I, can, I can respond to that in, in general. I think we also have to consider that if you want to do this in industry, there are practical limitations as well. You don't want to make this overly complex. The specimen preparation has to be sufficiently easy, um, which is why I think that the arrow shape tab, that, that has a good balance because that I think is relatively easy to, to implement. Um, I think the continuous tabs have the drawback that a lot of people in the industry, they want to know strength more than they want to know failure strain. Um, and you actually cannot measure failure strain very accurately, uh, sorry, failure strength very accurately in um, the continuous tab design. Um, so those are yeah, my two main comments on that one from a practical or industrial point of view. Anybody else wants to comment on that? Gentle, I have a remark for you, okay? All right, I, and, and I, I like the, the idea of using these arrow tabs. So I understand you need more experience on this and you know to optimize and so on. But I have one comment. Uh, you have uh, shown a finite element model and you have talked about the stress concentration. In practice, there is a strain concentration, a stress concentration. But in your model, what you have is a singularity because you have a reentrant corner. So when taking the result from there to extrapolate to the real thing, it may be complicated depending on when you put your eyes to check the value of the stress. Another possibility that we can talk in the future is instead of using the stresses, to use the singular stress state with the singularity order, the stress uh, equivalent stress concentration factor that can be can be done with no uh, great difficulty because maybe it gives you more possibility, for instance, to analyze the configuration of the tab, not only the angle but also the orientation of the fiber or, or what you are going to put there, it, 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 or the properties or so on to decrease the parameters that control. Uh, let's say the fracture mechanic point of view uh, of the of the problem. Yeah, I, I think that's a correct concern in the sense that uh, 
the peak values that I reported, I would not take them too literally um, because there are mesh size dependencies. Um, we, we did apply one tiny trick in the sense that our arrow was not um, a perfect corner. It was slightly rounded off um, to help um, a little bit with this issue. Um, but yeah, you would indeed um, have to be careful. But I think overall, the most important thing is that you show that you want to have a lower stress concentration and it's much more local than in the other uh, tab design. So I think for us overall, that provides the, the support for why this works. But yeah, the specific values, I, I agree with your concern on that. Lax, you want to respond to that? Yeah, it is regarding the, the stress singularity because uh, you're comparing now, you could say the, the arrow shape with the, uh, uh, you could say a sharp uh, edge of, of, a, of the, uh, the tap. And in, in principle, you can taper the, the tap so you can get more or less width of, of the stress singularity at the tip. It's just a matter of how shallow you, you're making it. Um, uh, so, so why do you think the arrow is better than, than the, the taper tap? Well, I, I think there is, in, at least in my opinion, there's a clear reason for that because um, I, in the ideal case, you put your arrow completely inside the grip um, and then you actually have an applied force on the grip, even up to the tip of the arrow. The problem with the, the taper design or the taper end taps to be specific is that you cannot apply force to the, to the tapered region. So essentially the stress transfer there is not as efficient. Um, and especially if you then think about also using this in fatigue testing, um, that would not work that well probably because you would get quickly delamination underneath and, and th that would not, or it would not happen as easily in the arrow shape design. I'm guessing that you, your analysis was a linear analysis, Yentl, was it? Yes. yes. Because uh, actually the, the non-linearity in the shear will soften those stress concentrations. So actually the ones you showed were, were quite high, uh, but actually they're probably less than that because of the non-linearity. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I don't okay. have much more else to add to that, but uh, I agree, yeah. At last, can I just ask you actually about... Uh, uh, your specimens. So were they only single tapered? I wasn't quite sure whether you had a taper through the thickness. Uh, only it, was only, it was only the tap which was tapered. The, there was no uh, tapering of the of the material through the thickness. Um, Sorry, was the tab tapered through the thickness? But yeah. Not, but not the material? Okay. Not the material, yeah. Because so I think only, in the, yes. the, the specimen that I showed, which I think came from earlier work from, from your lab, didn't it? And that had a, a tapering through the thickness as well. Okay, but uh, not oh, not yeah. in either of these case we have not uh, okay. right. tapered into the the, the material. Uh, we have we have been concerned about that before, but uh, but maybe for this more uniform uh, homogenized material we have here, it may be okay to 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 machine it down in in a thickness direction because there you may also have that uh, that a clamp it will prevent uh, a, a it was a delamination happening which are not the same in the width. The splitting in the width is not supported by loads or prevented by loads. So there you may have easier splitting than you have in a thickness direction. But of course, you're also in introducing some uh, failure points. And especially if you talk about fatigue uh, test sample, then the, the machining in the thickness may be, uh, you would say, a critical thing to, to do. Okay, I saw at some point that Dennis also had a, had a question for the rest of the panel. Is that still relevant? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to to add to uh, Michael's um, tap idea that uh, we face the same. So if we make the tap taps longer than the gripping area, or if we shaped it like uh, last did, um, we also faced what I showed in my presentation that uh, the tensile strength seemed to decrease. So um, for us, there there was only the possibility to use taps which are as long in the maximum as our gripping area and um, this is mostly 50 uh, millimeters with most machines but we also have uh, some with, with less so this is also tricky by standardized uh, some samples um, yeah maybe yeah. final comment on that and then we'll go into break lives yeah because in principle i think that because we are measuring the, the opposite that we get uh, improving the properties so so maybe we should dig into that and and find a case where you are 
measuring the opposite and then see uh, uh, is that you could say and maybe repeat that uh, in one of the other lab to to check because uh, yeah it it, it bothering me that we are we are getting at the opposite results in some way uh, for, for some of the materials. Okay, um, thank you to all the panelists. We will have a 10 minute break now and we will resume at 4.30 and then we'll open up the floor for questions from the audience. I see that there's already quite a, about eight questions in the Q&A. There's a few in the chat as well, but please post them in the Q&A section. That's a little bit easier for us to monitor and to make sure that we address all of them. We will see you again at 4.30 uh, Belgian time, 3.30 UK time and whatever time zone you are in. We apply to the outer surface of the specimen with some compression. So the question is going to be all the, you know, the fiber on the layer uh, through the thickness is going to be under the same level of stress and strain. So there is going to be some variation if, uh, if especially specimen is going to be so thick. So it may be useful to have some measurement of those kind of strains as, you know, a difference through the thickness for the uh, thick specimen when you uh, uh, pull the tensile test. Yeah, and also in general, I would certainly support some more research into the difference between length scaling, cross-sectional scaling, thickness scaling. There is, as far as I know, essentially no um, published data on how they differ. And I think at the moment, nobody really knows how different they are, especially not on an experimental side. I've seen some modeling data, but that has some of its own issues. Uh, I think Dennis also wanted to respond. Yeah, I just wanted to add here that uh, we also found, uh, or what is uh, one, one uh, possibility is uh, when you increase the, the volume and the thickness, for example, then you also increase the, the forces uh, during test. And then you have to, to withstand this with the load introduction. So also with the shear strength of the, of the adhesives for the taps. That's one, one problem we face there. And the other one is the more your actual force is, the more you have to clamp. And there we also find with hybrid specimen that it gets really uh, decisive if you have the, for example, stiff layers outside or inside. So that they are coming much more into play. So. Yeah, perhaps a final comment. I think from Lars, you wanted to add something as well. No? Okay. Um, okay, then I think we move to the next question um, from Povol. Failure motors piddling along the UD fibers and high energy release rate resulting in dynamic failure and damage. This is reduced in the hybrid configuration. It will probably be the reason for higher failure strains. Therefore, hybrid or continuous steps, another material combination and cannot, in my opinion, be used to back calculate the UD properties. So Pavel is essentially saying that he doesn't agree that you can get, you can do the back calculation um, that is sort of needed to get strength, for example, from the continuous steps. I guess perhaps Michael or Gergay wants to respond to that. Well, I'm not quite sure what the issue you're raising there is. Uh, I would argue that uh, the failure in the carbon, if we're talking about gas carbon hybrid, the failure in the carbon is initiated at, at some critical cluster of weak fibres. And then what happens afterwards, the splitting is a, is a later Event. It's not what actually controls it. Therefore, it, if the splitting is affected by the other layers, I'm not sure that it really matters. Well, I, perhaps it might. I, in some cases, if you have a pure UD specimen, sometimes failure is triggered to splitting. Um, and it could be that the presence of glass flies on top could sort of delay that a little bit. I think that's what Povel is um, is okay. responding to. I, I don't know to what extent this how how strong that effect is, but that could potentially happen, I think. Well, I've certainly seen a similar sort of effect with bending specimens. So if you have a, a UD specimen in bending, you get a lot of splitting on the surface and uh, and they can split right along the gauge section. Whereas if you have a, a laminate with other ply orientations, then that prevents that splitting from occurring. So I suppose if you have a distributed failure over a large gauge length, then that splitting may be, uh, may be affected by the, the layer or the other material. But I think that that's probably not the typical 
failure of most carbon fibers. I think the more yeah. controlled by... I would actually also yeah. add on top of my earlier comment there what Michael said that if you do get failure initiated by splitting, that probably means that you did not cut nicely along the fiber direction. And that means that you actually did not get proper failure because you didn't have a proper specimen to start with. And, and it could be that the continuous stab design is more forgiving for that issue. But the That's real it. issue is making your specimens properly to start with. Well, I, I mean, I'm not sure it's just making the specimens properly because the fibers are not perfectly parallel, like especially us modelers might like to assume. They do wander about and therefore inevitably on the, the surface you have broken fibers. And actually we've shown in other work that that can quite profoundly affect the failure mechanisms. I'm not sure I completely agree with that, but okay, well, I'll let it pass. Um, any other panelists that want to comment on this? Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe I can add a few words. So I think uh, splitting is, is probably uh, really not the first event in, in this failure process. So, so we probably have a critical cluster breaking before uh, something starts or can start splitting. And we are more interested in this first event, I think. And actually, in most of the cases, um, Okay, that's, that's true that uh, in the hybrid specimens, uh, we don't have much splitting and that may be uh, due to the fact that we, uh, we have something to um, um, somehow uh, keep the, the fiber, the, the carbon fiber epoxy layer together. And maybe in, in a monolithic specimen, we have more, but um, as far as I've seen in the hybrid specimens, there is uh, something like a clear cut across the fibers, which we can observe. Um, of course, it's hard to, to say uh, what happens in a monolithic specimen because it's so catastrophic and everything flow, uh, falls apart and, and explodes. But in, in some cases, uh, we can find uh, pieces of the full width of the specimen, which, which uh, confirms that there was not that much splitting, but in other cases, there is uh, this brush style failure. And uh, the interesting thing is that people might think that uh, this brush uh, failure means that uh, it happened within the, the gauge section, but it's, it's completely false because if you put the two parts of the brush next to each other, both brushes are uh, about the, the length of the gauge length, which means that uh, the tips of the, the, the splitted fibers actually came from the opposite uh, end tab. So um, it's interesting, but I, I don't think that this uh, presence of splitting is, is the key issue here. Uh, okay. It's more um, about initiation. But perhaps let's, uh, Pavel raised his hand, so maybe he wants to clarify this question or respond to anything that was already raised. If you have permission to speak now. Thank you very much. Hello, guys. Uh, uh, I think that the brushing, the failure modes you see in all these uh, tests, the final failure, they all brush up all the specimens. But if you look at these uh, hybrid specimens, they don't brush up. It means that you have a constraint of the brushing up uh, on the hybrid. And then you can see what is, uh, you can discuss what is the scaling. You know there is an effect when you have a hybrid, you mix the carbon and glass. You can mix it fiber by fiber, bundle by bundle, or layer by layer. But it's a, a, a size effect of that. doesn't matter if you have 0.2 millimeter uh, carbon with uh, 0.2 millimeter glass on, on either side, or is it uh, 2 millimeter with 4 millimeter glass uh, in total? I, I, I believe that uh, the glass will uh, uh, prevent the failure mode. And therefore, if you use and when you use these hybrid and back calculate, then you get and you see you get higher values. But it's not because of the, the behavior of the UD carbon, it's because of your, uh, you, uh, uh, you make a, a hybrid material. Yeah, okay, I, I, I understand your point. I, I think it's a bit of a difficult issue because we don't exactly know what what happens first and what really triggers it in in the experiments um, anybody else that wants to add a comment to this 
Yes, let's. Just, just, yeah, uh, just actually this, uh, what is the correct uh, failure mode? Because in, in principle, yeah, we, we are preventing uh, one failure mode, uh, the spitting or uh, or sometimes the brushing, but that's depend also on, on the thickness of the carbon in the middle uh, by putting a layer on. But but is that, uh, you could say, a wrong failure mode we are preventing or is it a correct failure mode? So in principle, you need to know what is the, the correct failure mode for a, uh, you could say a perfect uh, uniaxial uh, tensile uh, test of, of, of a uh, wider uh, UD uh, uh, composite. Of course, we should accept that there are undulation and uh, and variation in, in the composite because we are not we don't live in a idle work world, but we in some way we are trying to mimic a, a you could say a uniaxial tensile uh, stress state. So 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 that we should aim for. Uh, and have failure from that. Okay, then I think Michael wants to respond to that, and then I think we should wrap up and move to the next question. Well, so what I was going to say, I think this is an important question. I think we do need to make some comparisons from different test methods, and, and what we want to do is get the same result from different good validated test methods. So maybe we could already do this, Gergé. If you share your IM7 data from your hybrids, we can compare it with our volume scaled results and see whether we get the same result. But, but those were done a long time ago, and maybe we should do some more tests to make comparisons between, let's say, tapered specimens and hybrid specimens. I think that'd be a very valuable exercise to do, and it would help reinforce confidence in both methods. So we, we only have uh, so far two uh, different volumes, which are quite... Uh, uh, One's enough. Quite, uh, get the same result with your volume as we get with our unhybrid specimen. Oh, that, that's fine, yeah. I can, I can let's let's follow up on that one. Yeah. Okay, um, I would propose to move to the next question from Alan. Um, trying to measure precisely the UD strength is all well and good, but, but the practical use in any useful laminate will be multi-directional. So I think we've already sort of covered that in the meantime, um, but yeah, there are some additional damage mechanisms that can reduce this. We already talked about transverse cracking and to some extent the laminations as well. Um, does anybody further want to comment on this? From the panel members? Yes. Uh, it is true that most are uh, multidirectional, but it's uh, interesting to know that uh, most of the companies design one laminate just, we have, complicated theories about, uh, you know, the development of mechanism of damage, progression, onset, propagation. But basically what is used is the value of the strength at failure of the zero degree lamina. That's all. That's all what they, they, they check. That's all. Obviously, if you have a hundred of different stress states, uh, for each of them, one could be the zero degree lamina. In some cases where you have a, a structure like a beam, you know where is the, the, the zero degree lamina from the very beginning. And that's all they check. So most of the components are uh, designed just with the value of XT in terms of XT or in terms of the equivalent uh, strain. So for this reason, this is important. This is important because it is it, the parameter basically used to design very complicated uh, composite uh, components. Yeah, I, I perhaps want to add to that, even if you apply safety factors to this XT value, you still need to know what the XT value is before you can apply the safety factor. So I don't think that alleviates the importance of measuring this parameter accurately. Mm -hmm. Anybody else wants to comment on this? Yes, especially when you are going to some modeling of that, you know, uh, laminate composite structure, then uh, we cannot measure those property of the uh, different lamination every time, you know, every test. So that knowing the property of that uh, unidirectional composite, then we can also predict that, you know, the strengths of that uh, laminate structure is going to be very useful for uh, modeling and simulation purpose. Okay, um, I would propose that we then move to the next question. It's actually three questions, but I'll just start off with the first one. This is directly addressed to Michael. Um, what do you mean exactly by equivalent volume for bending specimens in your case, and how is it determined in particular? 
So the equivalent volume I used, uh, there's an equation based on integrating the stress, taking account of the viable statistics. So that goes back to papers quite some time ago. I think originally starting with ceramic materials, but uh, there is an equation which you can then integrate the stress distribution. And that's what was done on that particular test. Uh, I think comparing tensile and flexure strength estimates, I think that, uh, so I'm not sure quite got what the question was there. So, uh, I mean, basically, if, if you just consider the, the volume, I and mean, then the simple way of doing it is if you just, if you've got a thick lamina, you just take what's the, the surface ply. But the, the, that's a very simple approach. But actually, if you can integrate through the thickness, you get a more exact expression. It seems to work quite well. The expression that I showed with that, those glass data, it worked pretty well. Um, and the comparison, the viable moduli, tensile and bending compare. I don't think we've got enough data really to, to compare that. The one plot I did show, we put, managed to put a single viable through both of them, but uh, I don't think we've really got enough data to know that. So I think this comes back to what we've said a few times is I think we need more tests with reliable test methods on a range of different materials. Okay, anybody else wants to pick up on that or is that fully answered? Okay, then we will move to the next one. This is directly for Federico. Um, reported increasing the length of end taps could reduce the stress concentration, but also that it could uh, increase the transfer stress concentration. So therefore reducing the transfer stress concentration might be re the reason to get better results in the case of 50 millimeter end taps. Do you want to respond to that, Federico? Yes, uh, I'm not sure if I have understood the, the, the point. So um, it is true that in the example I have shown, two, uh, measure, two measures were taken. So what was the origin of the improvement? We are not sure. You are assigning that the origin of the improvement was the increasing, uh, I mean, the decrease in the length of the end taps. Maybe, we don't know. So it, it is not something that we have uh, make specific research. What you are saying is something that we should now investigate. But it, I have just shown that uh, the industry solved the problem in some way, you know, that is in the, in the, in the background of our discussion, uh, giving a value, giving a value, that's all. Is representative this value of the real behavior of a material? I don't know. I don't know the role of the transverse strength uh, stresses that you mentioned. I don't know. I think it's an, an important general point that we have to be careful just to look at stress concentration along the fiber direction. And, and also considering transverse stress concentration that can also matter because it can help uh, to figure premature splitting, for example. But just looking at longitudinal stress uh, concentration is not always enough to really analyze the differences between the tap configurations, for example. Does anybody want to further comment on this? I have a question and comment. So when you have a different length of the end tap, then one of the question is going to be how much portion is going to be actually compressed by the grip, the whole tap area or some partial of that one. I think that was a factor, you know, that, uh, that I mean, uh, the influence of tap onto that uh, the, uh, specimen. So whether they are doing consistently or if you have a different tap size, then they are also uh, changing that one. So you have to be a little more consistent of the, those kind of, you know, uh, the condition for, you know, look at the uh, effect of the, uh, the uh, tap size. Yeah. Yes, I, I have to say that um, Michael asked me a question that I have uh, answered him in, in the tab, in the chat, because I, I, I didn't uh, hear very well the question. But you are right in the sense that uh, in this case, in the case I have presented, the whole length of the tab were covered by the grip system. This is very important. If it, this changes, it, you can have completely different results. And in fact, when you reduce the, the, the size of the tap, you are putting more shear stress and you can have something that 
force you to declare uh, not representative the test, which is the debonding in between the tab and the, the specimen itself when the surface decreases. Max, you want to respond or follow up? Yeah, it's regarding because I think the, the matter of have a large uh, region in a, in a gripping area, just thereby you can lower the, the amount of uh, compressive uh, forces and therefore make a smaller, you could say, compressive failure. But 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 matter of making it long or make it wide, that's, you could say, two uh, possibilities. I think make it long, we still have the problem that uh, near the end of the grips, we have still uh, large uh, shear uh, stresses. Make it wider, that's uh, a way to avoid that. But then, of course, we then we have the problem of uh, splitting. So 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 this is a trade-off, but... but but it is a, in, in making this butterfly, I think the benefit is actually to, to lower the grip pressure and, and the shear forces at the grips. Uh, yeah. yeah, I agree. I think that's a good point, Lars. So can um, I make one comment about, yeah. about that? And that's, uh, it's not entirely obvious to me that uh, tab debonding is a bad thing because actually tab debonding helps to reduce the stress concentration at the tip of the tab. And then you rely a bit more on friction for the load transfer at the end rather than the adhesive strength. So we've seen some other tests where actually deliberately debonding the specimen improves the strength. Yeah. I, I may I, add so shortly that, that uh, in fatigue is a really bad thing because that we can see the sample is heating up, but, but in, in, in statically, uh, it's no, it may not be, be an issue uh, or it may, may not yeah. be a bad thing. I think that's a good point in fatigue. To some extent, the same problems arise, but some of them get worse than others. And uh, this is a good example, I think. Um, Gerge, do you also want to respond, or Federico? Um, yes, I just wanted to, uh, uh, to join Michael, uh, saying that uh, I think if we, if we have um, an initiation of debonding, uh, because we leave the tip of the uh, and have standing out of the grip could be a good thing. And uh, actually having a long damage process zone uh, is, is also helpful in, uh, say, smearing out the stress concentrations. And usually the adhesives uh, can do this. They are quite, quite um, soft, let's say, or, or um, plastic or ductile, if we want. So yes, yeah, sometimes I, I think it can help. One, one short comment. Uh, I agree that you can take some measurement that provoke an increase in the level of the strength. But now the question is, which is the correct one? The highest or the lowest? I'm not sure. So it depends on how your situation correlates with the situation that the material is going to have in the aircraft. One thing. And the, th the second is that I, I have mentioned it, the bonding because if you have the bonding, the standard, tell you that the, 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 the test is invalid. So um, I, I trust on, on, on the fact that you have mentioned, it can increase, but it's not valid for the standard. So that's all. Okay. Um, I would propose that we move to the next question from Hamed. Um, this is essentially about whether this is a true material property and Hamed seems to imply that it is not. Um, I guess there will be some comments on that from various panel members. I'll, I could go first, but I'll leave it first to the others. Okay, well, uh, um, this is a bit of the thing we discussed at the last workshop. And uh, uh, is there such a thing really as a true one single material property? Uh, that that perhaps is again a philosophical question. But it certainly seems from a practical point of view that there is an effect on volume, on strength, and therefore we need to account for it. So uh, I guess it's a philosophical question. I, I think last time, Michael, you also responded by saying that the material property is the strength plus the Weibull scaling parameters. And if you include that as part of the material parameter, then I think it is indeed the material yeah. parameter. I, I agree, yeah. Thank you. I agree. Anybody else wants to add to that? Maybe a short day. It, 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 we need to find out what to measure to, to get some something so we can predict 
but what, what is the strength when you are going to other to sample size? So, so in some way, yeah. So, so whether we have one value or we have a size dependent value or we have a value which are depending on something else in the material, but, but at least we need to be able to predict that uh, based on the measurements. Yeah, okay. I think the panel is more or less in agreement on this. I don't know whether Ramesh agrees with us, but um, at least the panel seems to be in agreement. Federica, do you want to add to this? No, not to say, uh, you know, not to say anything implies that, at least in my case, that I agree with the sentence. So I agree with it, it's clear. Yeah. I think also in general, if you look at anything that we consider a material property, if you look at it in enough detail, you can always make an argument that it's not a material property. It just depends also on the level of detail that you, you look at. Okay. Um, then the next one is from Yanis. Uh, Yeah, so this sort of built on the same topic of, of in situ strength. And I, I, yeah, I think this is indeed to some extent this is true, especially when it comes to size. But Jan is also specifically refers to the surface defects and then constraints. Um, anybody wants to comment on that aspect in specifically? Uh, I, I can perhaps start um, but from a from a modeling point of view. If in in our model, if we uh, include um, constraints at the boundary, um, you essentially will have um, you. For example, if you have glass flies on the surface, um, they contribute more to stress transfer. If you have a fiber break of the of the carbon fibers near the edge, so that actually is some degree of fly constraint. And that is part of the reason why you have hybrid effects. But I would argue that as soon as you go above 100 micrometer fly thickness, this effect becomes so small that you can start ignoring it. So it's true, but only in what very thin flies, I think. Once you go above 100, I don't think that matters anymore. And that is, a, is one limitation of the continuous tab design. It only works for sufficiently thick uh, fly, but 100 micrometer, I would not say it's very thick. That's a single conventional fly would already get you above that value. Anybody else wants to add to that, Federico? Yeah, I, I have discussed with Kenny a lot of time about this question. I agree with, with him, but the only thing is that I'm not sure that we can compare this effect with the inside to uh, strength associated to the transverse cracking in, in laminates. Because in the case of the uh, in in situ strength, typically associated with uh, this 90 degrees uh, lamina of a laminate, we have two mechanisms of failure that appear depending on the thickness in in in, in different ways. I'm not sure. I have to study this particular question to see the representativity or the value obtained. Because if there is only one mechanism of failure, then we have not the same problem that in the inside the strength. Okay. That's okay. Um, we still have four no, three open questions and we have 15 minutes. I've, I'll just let Lax uh, finish up this this answer round then Lax. Yeah I was actually thinking about because if if you do a you could say a tensile test of metallic material and we have necking uh, there we are we say uh, judging that the necking is is the, the, the strength of our test sample. But I've seen study where if you put, we say, a ductile layer on that, so a polymeric uh, material on, on a surface, then you can actually, you could say, uh, delay this uh, localization. So, so is that what we are doing here? So, so the, 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 the glass fiber layer, will that delay the localization in a, in a, in a carbon fiber composite? And is that then a valid way to, to judge the strengths in principle, the localization is also not a material property. Now we again begin to talk about the uh, interaction to the geometry of, of our test sample. Uh, is, is yeah. So. I think there is something to be said for how the continuous taps affect the Poisson contraction because they don't have the same Poisson ratio as the carbon flies. So there is going to be some degree of effect, but 
honestly, I don't think that difference is that large that you can expect a significant effect, but I, that's just speculation or intuition. I, I don't have any hard evidence for that. It's very small. We have done some calculations. Very small effect, I would argue, for the materials we used. Yeah, I think that's probably true for most common material combinations. But uh, once you start going to more exotic materials, perhaps it's a different story. Um, Federico, do you want to? No, no, no. No, OK. Um, I would propose that we then go to the next question from Stepan. Um, Um, I'm not entirely sure how to respond. I'm not sure that I completely understand that, uh, that question. So, yeah, I think in general, I agree that it, the size effect originates largely from the Weibull distribution. Um, I think that's quite well established. Of course, that assumes that we ignore any sort of manufacturing defects and fiber misalignments and how voids can potentially affect this. Um, for the rest, I'm not sure what I should be answering here. Does anybody want to follow up on this? Not immediately, apparently. Um, so perhaps, Stepan, if you want to have this addressed in more detail, perhaps clarify what you want us to address. I think it's just not sufficiently clear to us what you mean exactly. Um, but in the meantime, um, we will go to the next question from Yanis. Um, that's directly for Michael. So can you address this, Michael? It's about the shape factor. Yeah, I was just trying to find the paper to, uh, to look at the value. So generally speaking, uh, we do get with a good test, you do get very low coefficient of variation. And uh, so I think that the typical variation you see in a tensile test is affected by not just the material variability, but the test variability. So you might expect to see slightly higher variability in your individual tests compared to what you see from the size effect. However, in the past, we've have seen the opposite effect. In bending tests we did many years ago, we found that the coefficient of variation was actually lower than uh, in the bending tests than we got from the, uh, from the size effect. And we never really fully satisfactorily explained that. Um, but overall, I would say that, uh, that they are of similar magnitude to the extent to which we can really make a valid comparison. Okay, anybody wants to add to that? After we can split it close. Um, then the next one is by Ramesh. I just found the, the coefficient of variation on those tests varied between 1.4% for the largest specimens and 5.4% uh, for the smallest specimens. No, I would say that's very good, especially the 1.4%. That's yeah. impressive. So if you ignore the, the smallest ones, that was 1.4, 3.32%. So they're actually probably pretty consistent with that 41 value. Okay, so the question from Ramesh is a follow up on the previous discussion. Um, I, I think to some extent, I, I disagree. I think we can pretend that we're trying to find a material property that can go into a model as also highlighted by Endel. If you know how this property scales with size, then I think you have a lot of information to put this in a higher level model and then Having a good way of measuring that that longitudinal tensile strength is very important and and relevant, um, especially of course if you can combine it with the size effect. Um, anybody else wants to add anything to that? Uh, simply to say that I agree with you, gentle. So one thing is that we have no confidence on one parameter, but we're engineers and we need to do our job in the uh, uh, shortest period of time with the highest level of accuracy. And this is what we have. If our material is in this way, we need to use it, the information we have to in a complicated model to predict the behavior. 
This is what we have now. I don't know in the future, but now I agree with you, what you have said, Gentle. Yeah. Um, okay, so I will consider that close. Then we have a question from Masaki, uh, who is apparently involved in standardization. That's, that's interesting. Um, so he refers to a new standard. I'm not entirely sure whether methods for measurement of true thickness laminate properties, why I don't understand why that's relevant here. Um, so I think it's certainly um, the fact that we are having this discussion for me really shows that the current standards are just not appropriate to get reliable values. Um, and they may be okay for some um, randomly oriented composites, for example, where grip failures is less severe, but certainly for UD composites, and I think also even for cross-ply composites or woven composites, this is in most cases an issue. So certainly having an update of the current standards would certainly be useful, but I understand it's often a very long and slow process. Um, does anybody else want to comment on this question? Sergei? I think the second part of the uh, question uh, is, is more uh, interesting for us. It says for load introduction, if you can reach some goals, and uh, if load introduction means load introduction into UD specimens, that is about entabbing and uh, hybrid specimens, continuous entabs, anything uh, we discussed today. And he seems to be uh, very open for proposals. I mean, I think we have several proposals, um, but we should, of course, I think to enter into a standard, you should have sort of one, one approach that fits all. And I'm, I'm not sure we are there yet. I don't think we have one solution that works in all cases and that is at the same time easy to implement. I think we can do better than the current standards. That's not too difficult, but... Uh, but um, sorry, I, I still think that it's it's good to uh, have the view of uh, of a man from a standardization body, uh, who knows uh, what is the uh, accepted level of complication in terms of uh, specimen uh, fabrication, for example, or evaluation, especially uh, with the hybrid specimens. We don't have a, a direct uh, way of measuring the strength, just the strain to failure. Also, uh, we need to um, do a, um, a compensation for thermal strains, residual strains, because we cure the specimen at uh, elevated temperature and then cool it down. Also, we kind of ignore the shrinkage of the resin in the uh, composite uh, layers. Uh, so what is the level of, of, of detail the audience, the industry may accept in a standard? I think these are key points to discuss uh, with a, a standard uh, making man or, or somebody involved in these processes. Okay, Lars? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, uh, I think one of the concern is, is, is to extend the validity of, of the standard. So, so our challenge is that then when we're testing a thicker laminate, then we do not we cannot find standards which are describing how to do that uh, so 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 for that case uh, we are trying we, we are trying to to in some way because we cannot uh, fulfill the requirement for thickness when we do a tensile test then uh, we need to do something else in addition so as i think to to extend the validity of of the the, the present standards is, is one way to, to influencing this. Uh, other ways, of course, to make new standards, but I think it's better to, or maybe easier to, to extend the validity of, of, of the standards which are already there. Um, um, I saw that Masaki had raised his hand. Um, I can allow you to talk if you want to comment on this or clarify anything, because I think there's quite a big interest in talking to you about the stand potential standardization requirements. Okay, thank you very much. So they, they give a chance to talk. And uh, I think that just I uh, 
wrote down in the questions that we have already standardized the through the uh, strength and through the sickness direction. It's a quite a difficult test method, but it, but uh, but if you can show that the how say the uh, rec the requirement from the point of view of the standardization is that the uh, the scatter within the labs and the scatters among the labs are uh, within the certain levels through the round robin test, then we can, then we have the, uh, the, uh, the, then we have, and also we have the, uh, this, uh, how to say, the concrete proposal for the, uh, the, the concrete uh, document for the standard, then we can accept. So uh, the, from my point of view, that the I, within the ISO standard, there is a how say one some standards are the very precise or rigorous, and some standards are more from the engineering point of view, and both are acceptable. And through today's discussion, that if you can, uh, some some of you can propose through your national representatives to have the you uh, testing method for. To, Another testing method for UD laminates because we have the test method for, for the UD laminates as an ISO 527-5. That, that, that's just an engineering one, I think. And you can propose the more uh, precise one that the, yeah, I think that uh, through the discussion we can accept. That's, that's my point. And as, as, as examples, we have already had through the thickness. Uh, test method. We use the wider distribution with the eff effective volume. So that's a quite good example that we can have a standard with the effective volume. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I know from previous discussions that I've had with some of the panel members here that there is actually some interest to, to set up some type of round robin test, which was even not directly related to developing a new standard, but I think that would certainly be very useful if, if we set it up in a proper way that this could have an impact in the longer term on, on standard development. So perhaps we cannot uh, arrange all the details here, but I think that's certainly a useful thing to, to set up in the future um, between some of the panel members here. And then we can also see whether there are other labs that would be interested to join in this round robin exercise. Anybody who wants to further comment on this, Gergay? I'm certainly in the round robin. Anybody else? Uh, I think we should certainly clarify exactly what is then needed in a, but we will perhaps set up a follow up phone call. Um, with a few people that are interested. Lax, do you want to? Hey, I, I think, I, I, of course, I should <laughs> have a uh, talk with the lab. And, and, and uh, uh, currently, we have a all, uh, very much all book, but I think uh, we are we are interested in uh, on Robin because we need to to uh, to uh, say make this better and make this more consistent. So it's not the the results is depending on the lab, but but uh, but we are can get the same we say measurements. Um, Okay, um, we still have three questions. I think one has more a comment perhaps, um, but I, the one from Carlos I want to address because that has been in the waiting line for a while now. That's directly for Michael, again, on the equivalent volume in the presence of uh, gradients and how you handle that. Uh, so, I th well, I thought I'd really answer that in terms of this equation based on integrating the stresses uh, through the thickness. So there is an equation for that, which uh, I can point you to the right direction for the. the do, do you need to know the Weibull modulus for that calculation? Yes. Which, how, yes. how do you handle that's, that in practice? Because. Well, so you, well, you, you, it's a sort of iterative process. So you, uh, you have, you, you have to get a set of consistent data. So. Yeah. Okay. I see. It, so, so in the case of that one, I showed the 29, uh, then I, if I remember correctly, it was more than 20 years ago, but uh, I think we, we put a rough fit through the viable modulus and then based on that estimated viable modulus, we corrected the volumes 
with that biomodulus, and then we got a, a better line. And it, it converges very quickly, so it wasn't a big issue. Okay. Um, so we are um, approaching the next part where we are going to try and conclude. I would want to make sure that we actually finish as promised at six o'clock. Um, so I think we there's one comment and one question left, but unfortunately, I think we should move on. If there's time at the very end, maybe we can go back to this. Um, so I would want to try and conclude what, what we have learned today. I think for me, the most important thing is that we have raised awareness of all the difficulties in measuring longitudinal tensile strength or fiber direction tensile strength, whatever you want to call it, or XT, as some people have called it here. Um, that, that I think is very important and, and useful for the community as well. Um, what other things do people from the panel want to add in terms of conclusions? Uh, I think it's been really valuable that, that we have been able to say uh, stick to the same uh, topic and, and then uh, then uh, look at that from 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 uh, from the side at least uh, the seven different uh, uh, sites and then uh, maybe all can can contribute to this also. I think it's it is it's so uh, central part of, of our work to 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 know the tensile strength of a UD composite. So. So this should be something we should be able to, to solve. Uh, so, yeah. uh, or at least find out why we cannot solve it. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say that I was very happy with the uh, um, large interest in this whole uh, uh, event and also the level of uh, engagement through the questions. So I, I think this is really a, this was a good opportunity, and I I hope that there will be uh, many more of these kind of events in yeah. the future. We had a hundred and ten attendees at at the peak. Now we are down a little bit, but I think that also makes sense. Not everybody needs necessarily wants to have a very detailed discussion that we've had, but I think they are very useful for the people that are still attending. Anybody else wants to add something to this? After the uh, the break, there was eighty five people engaging, which is, I think, really a good one. Good yeah. one. So I would echo your comments, uh, Jentel. I think this has been a very good event for highlighting the issues and uh, talking about some of the problems. And although I've thought about these things for for many years, uh, a few things came out to me which were were, were quite interesting. Uh, I think, in terms of taking things forward. I think, as I mentioned a bit earlier, I think what we really need to do is to get different test methods which where we can identify consistent values from, from different methods, because that's a good way of validating all the methods. When you get a different value from every method you use, then that really implies that none of the methods are reliable. So I think that would be a really interesting thing to try to make some comparisons between different methods on the same materials. And then I think more generally, we need more tests. Once we've established what these best methods are, we need to do more tests on different materials and to try to get to the bottom of some of these questions which we've raised today about the effect of, of splitting, for example, about the effect of, of the, the length versus the cross-sectional area, for example. Yeah, and it's, I would- It's very interesting. I think. To highlight one particular issue, the, the effect of the matrix on longitudinal tensile strength, for example, I've discussed that with several people here on the panel in the past. I mean, we essentially don't really know how important the matrix is from an experimental point of view. There is, I mean, some modeling studies on this, but from an experimental point of view, we've, especially in the, in the last few decades, we've actually more struggled with getting a reliable um, measurement technique. Um, and that has always prevented us from properly assessing how important the matrix is. But I think now we have several approaches that I think we have some degree of confidence in that they work. And then we can also analyze some of those effects, which I think have never really been established properly. You know, today we mostly focus on that, you know, uh, different shape, different design of the specimen and the, uh, the tap so that we can avoid the stress concentration, uh, you know, because of uh, the tap so that uh, the failure is going to be occur on the, uh, the specimen, you know, composite specimen. 
So that is very useful. But on the other hand, that even you have a perfect design of the specimen size and specimen shape and tap size, but still there are uh, uh, many parameters which are going to affect the strength of uh, the composite itself, you know, the fiber behavior or those kind of, you know, internal uh, the parameter. So if you cannot control those parameters, then even under the, those perfect condition, you know, the strength of composite is going to uh, change depending on how you fabricate and how you, you know, uh, the make the, uh, the specimen tool. So we need to also look into those kind of aspects to have more reliable and data for the, you know, strengths of unidirectional composite. Yeah. Okay. I, I would like to take this to uh, say, uh, what, what is the effect of the matrix? In some way, I think for most models, then the, the matrix is, doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, it's the fiber we intend, uh, tension. Uh, so it's the fiber which are, are, are mattering here. Of course, the uh, matrix matter for introducing the load into the test sample. But uh, but inside, you could say in the gate section, does it matter? And will we get the same uh, you could say results if we just uh, was changing the, the matrix, but but keep the fibers uh, and the fiber architecture? Uh, uh, so I, I don't completely agree with that. I, I think the matrix does matter and, and it has an effect, I think, of order of magnitude 10 to 20 percent, depending on how good of a matrix you're comparing against how bad of a matrix. But there is no real hard evidence because I think all the data that I'm aware of in the literature is affected by stress concentration at the grip and proper failure. Um, but also from a modeling point of view, we do see that if you have different plastic behavior of the matrix, it does have a significant effect in that range, 10, 20% if you compare the somewhat more extreme um, different, different cases. Any other comments from the panel on the conclusions? Um, Yes, Dennis. Sorry. Yeah, I just uh, maybe join uh, you, you there with two points. Uh, the one is, I think we saw that uh, in the case where the standards are defined for very thin uh, material with not that much of volume, they are not as bad. So the most results are quite near. But as, uh, for example, Lars showed, when you have some constraints like in thickness or you have some constraints like in environmental issues or whatever, then the deviation gets really bigger. And uh, for that case, I think it's it's really a good idea to to add more more uh, yeah, work on, on, on this part. And uh, just the second one was the uh, matrix resin. I just want to join Jentl there. So that is also something we see with just um, having um, issues with uh, water absorption. Um, even if you have a fiber which is not really um, yeah, tackled by by the moisture, then the UD strings might also decrease by by uh, matrix um, change in strain and, and strength. So, um, just also something to to look at in the future. Thank you. Okay. Um, perhaps we should move to the the final part and talking about next steps. Um, I think we've already highlighted one that I think there are some people interested here in talking about a potential round robin and potentially in the longer term updating of developing a new standard. So I, I will um, set up a phone call with Masaki Hojo to discuss this in more detail. I understand Gergay for certain is interested and, and Lax as well. And if anybody else in the audience is interested, let me know. And I can either involve you already in the first phone call or when we actually start doing the, the work. Um, that we then know who to contact, because obviously we would need a, a large group of people. Three or four labs is probably not not enough. We probably need a bit more than that. Any other uh, next steps that we see? Um, and then we'll still discuss topics for potential next workshops after that. Well, uh, I would like to say something because the idea we had originally was to revise different aspects of uh, the concept, the representativity of the concept strength in composite. When uh, we agreed, uh, Michael, you, Yentel, and me, we agreed to talk about uh, XT. 
I thought that it was the, the simplest one. So uh, <laughs> probably the most complicated can be either compression in the direction of the fiber, uh, tension normal to the fiber, and don't talk about shear. So uh, if we have need uh, now three hours, and I, I have learned a lot today, so hearing comments and, and so on, I don't know how it's going to work with uh, another, let's say, more complicated uh, property to measure. But uh, in my opinion, the following step would be taking care of what having said now, in particular with this round robin idea, and uh, generate another uh, meeting referring to uh, another property. And probably we can we can accept suggestions about the the, the next property to be investigated. Yeah. So um, on the topic of the next workshop, what I wanted to do is to send out um, anyway a link to the recording once it's it's uploaded the slide, and then also include a poll to ask people which topic would be most interesting uh, for for the next workshop where we would find the largest audience or where we see the biggest issues still. Um, and then based on that, we can decide um, how to proceed. I see that Lars wants to add something. Yeah, actually, because uh, the obvious, you could say, next step, I, I, at least from my world, in my world, is, is uh, compression. Uh, compression of UD is even more challenging than, than tension. Uh, uh, but, but that there's maybe more obvious reason for, for the, for, for the uh, the challenges. Intention is a little more from for me. Uh, why do we really work with this? Uh, oh, yeah, why do we have this challenge? But in compression, there's a lot of stuff to do for, in order to, to, to be better for that. Uh, yeah, I I also have the the sense that compression is perhaps the the next hot potato that we should try and tackle. Um, but that's just my thoughts. I will get input from all the people who attended today's workshop. Um, anybody else wants to comment on this? Or suggest other properties to look at, for example? Oh, I agree, compression is the next uh, uh, critical one. But I think in the future, we can also do ones on, on shear and transverse tension. So if the audience has any comments on this or any suggestions, you can type it in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, then we, but we will add, anyway also ask um, that via poll in the follow up email and we send out the recording and the slides. Um, okay, I guess we can more or less conclude here. We still have a few minutes left. Um, is there anybody who wants to add anything on the conclusions or the next steps? In Q and A, uh, the Ramesh suggests uh, some kind of the connection with the, the modeling. You know, we have focused on testing and then, you know, he suggests that, you know, some modeling, I mean, uh, how we can relate that uh, to, uh, you know, numerical modeling and simulation of the failure. Yeah, that's, that's good, what he suggests. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that would be a very good topic. We have to think of how to frame that because again, it's a very wide topic, but I think it would be very valuable to pursue that. Yeah, and I think Ramesh here is talking more about going towards higher scales. Um, we've also had a few questions that go towards the lower scale of fiber break modeling, and this would become more um, fly level modeling. Um, and yeah, I think there is also quite a lot of interest in that from the community. Um, okay. Um, I guess we can conclude here then. I think we've been talking, well, especially the panelists have been talking for three hours. Um, I, I just want to thank everybody who has attended, and in particular the panelists who presented their work and who, who led some of the discussion. Uh, but also very much thank you to the audience for being so active and engaging in asking all these questions. I think it's very good and contributes to the success of the workshop. So with that, I think we will conclude and we'll be in touch probably tomorrow when we get after the recording and uploaded it and so on then you'll hear from us, get a follow-up email from me. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you.